Welcome to today's reimagined session with uh, Blago Trajkowski. Today we will talk about uh, fiber optic communication, applied science, and implementation scenarios. Uh, so it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Blago Trajkowski, uh, who is actually uh, from Macedonia, from Bitola. Uh, so he first gained his practical experience in the field of fiber optic networks in Slovakia, in Silex which is a company which specializes in production and quality improvements of optical network components. And since then, he has been working in several different uh, applications of fiber optic networks in Neotel Macedonia and uh, now in Google Ireland for over 14 years now. Uh, his recent focus are the DWDM networks and research of the linear and nonlinear effects, as well as the uh, Raman amplifiers. Uh, Blagoj, welcome. Uh, we are very happy to have you today. So please take the floor. Thank you, Lina, and uh, thank you to the IT Labs team for this uh, opportunity for inviting me here. And uh, thank you to uh, everyone uh, joining this, this event. Today, I would like to talk about uh, fiber optic uh, communication, uh, which is the technology that enables the high volume of information transfer, lightning fast, literally. I'll go through some of the scientific effects behind it and uh, common implementation scenarios. Uh, before I go to the details, I would like to uh, say that this is my personal presentation and the uh, views and uh, uh, opinions are shared here are my own and I'm not representing any company or organization. Uh, the focus of today's uh, uh, speech will be about uh, digital communications and the role of the optical highways, as I uh, call them, uh, and uh, the history of the optical communications, then uh, we'll go to more details of the guided light and optical fibers, uh, uh, then going even further to details on the amplifiers as part of the TWDM networks, and the last uh, section is uh, reserved for the challenges uh, that uh, I've been uh, facing and uh, industry is uh, looking into it uh, when it comes to Raman gain performance. Uh, Ilina already said uh, most of the things uh, about me. I prepared to share more, but uh, I'll just say that uh, um, I had uh, 14 uh, years, I've, I've been working 14 years in this uh, industry, and uh, it's uh, my pleasure to um, connect some of the exciting effects of the physics with the practical use in the telecommunication business. Uh, I um, was born in Bitola and uh, where I completed the um, primary and secondary school. And it was the last year of the gymnasium when I realized that I would like to work something related uh, with uh, physics and the uh, idea of telecommunications came in. Then uh, it sounded very exciting to me. So I just uh, uh, pursued that path and I got the bachelor's and master's uh, from the Telecommunications Institute, Institute in uh, Skopje. And then uh, throughout the years, I had uh, uh, I was lucky to um, be in uh, different interesting companies and to explore different aspects of the fiber optic communications, lastly in the DWDM uh, networks as a transport links or optical highways for high data transfer. Uh, so since I mentioned them a few times, uh, let's go through the standard block diagram of a digital communication system, which is uh, widely distributed in the telecommunications uh, lecture. So here we can see which are the main blocks uh, from one end to another end of digital communication. At the beginning, we have a discrete uh, source, which uh, um, sections the information in, in bits, and then it goes to source uh, encoder, which removes the redundant information from, from the source. And then uh, it's the channel encoder, which actually in this case adds redundancy by using uh, some of the techniques like a forward error correction and uh, other algorithms that are um, making the transmission of the signal more reliable, then goes to the section that we'll spend uh, most of the uh, time today on, which is the uh, optical transmission for which we use modulator, then uh, channel, then, then modulator, and we'll go into details uh, further on. 
and then the reverse process is in the second part uh, of the uh, transmission where we use the channel decoder uh, to extract the information that was transmitted and then a source decoder and then finally the user receives hopefully uh, the information they 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 needed i say hopefully because during the transmission there are many um, effects that uh, distort the signal as you can see on the right hand side here uh, let me enable the laser yeah uh, so the perfect signal with no distortions no uh, uh, changes uh, is being transmitted and uh, depending on the quality in the length uh, and other attributes of the channel it changes and uh, we'll see later on how it can be seen on the other end uh, so uh, I mentioned a few, few of the things uh, earlier, just to recap, uh, the modulation is composed of a symbol alphabet. So in this case, I have one example of a 16 quam, which is a, a diagram of uh, uh, symbols, which have a different uh, uh, amplitude. And uh, depending on where they are positioned, they transmit different symbol and each symbol uh, consists uh, of uh, four bits. Um, it's important to mention here that uh, the TX and RX uh, need to agree on the symbol alphabet, so they will know how to extract the information that is modulated and uh, have common knowledge of the used analog uh, waveforms. The RX also needs to find the analog waveform that resembles the most of the received uh, signal. And this is a, a process called uh, match filtering. A uh, bit more to this section. So if we imagine the path of uh, the signal from electrical to optical and then back to electrical uh, domain, we see the middle section, which is uh, shown here in orange, consists of uh, the simple logical blocks of transmitter channel and receiver. So uh, in the field of uh, optical communications, this uh, channel is a medium where the light travels. It can be free space or it can be a wave guided medium like the optical fiber is, which will be the focus on, on, on this uh, presentation. Just a brief few examples where we can use it in a free space. It's uh, for the satellite communications or a short uh, reach uh, um, indoor uh, communication systems. Now, that channel that was in the middle of the previous diagram, in the field of the optical highways, which, which are the long haul optical connections between data centers or any uh, points of presence of telecommunication services, uh, we have the DWDM or Dane's Wavelength Division Multiplexing Transport uh, Systems. And uh, the name comes from the number of the wavelengths that are transmitted in uh, one pair or of uh, uh, fiber. Uh, so if you can see the top direction refers to the right, so that's a let's say transmit to receive, and then the other one is receive to transmit. How does that look in the real world? Once we have the a signal transmitted from electrical to uh, optical domain, then that is uh, modulated as a client at uh, normally 13, 10 nanometers, so it could be different frequencies as well, but it's a wide, uh, uh, range of frequencies that are representing one pulse, and it's often uh, called, called as a gray colored uh, signal. Then all of those gray colored signals are uh, multiplexed into one composite signal, and uh, like that, they are transmitted to the other end where the Dmax and the composition of the signal happens. Uh, for example, this can be in um, uh, channels of 200 uh, gigabits per second, and uh, that can be at uh, 1530 uh, nanometer. This is a one specific channel that I chose here as an example, but the whole um, the whole fiber pair can can have depending on the system 
uh, 96 channels of 50 gigahertz uh, uh, spacing, or it can be less uh, number of channels, but uh, with a uh, higher uh, channel width and therefore higher uh, speed of transmission. Since I mentioned the wavelengths, uh, I would like to give more context of what, where are the wavelengths that we are using in uh, this uh, optical communication system compared to the visible uh, spectrum of wavelengths. So if you see the visible spectrum of the wavelengths is on the left-hand side, and it's a shorter range of wavelengths, and uh, optical communication range is on the right-hand side, uh, using three windows originally it was uh, used to window one, then two, and then we realized there were many more benefits of uh, using the window uh, three. Uh, for optical transmission, specifically for multiple channels or DWDM systems. And going into more details to the DWDM uh, spectrum, we can see that nowadays we are using the C and L band, conventional and uh, long uh, wavelength band. And the specific wavelengths are listed here from 1530 to 1565 and 1565, 1625. And later on, I will share the uh, conclusion why we are using those. Uh, but before that, I would like to touch a bit on the history of the communication. And surprisingly or not, uh, uh, the first communication systems were um, of which we have proof of were used uh, about 200 uh, years BC. And uh, here on the picture, we have a proof of uh, Polybius in uh, ancient Greece uh, describing his improvement of source coding for data compression and uh, cryptography. Transmission rate at that time of the history was eight letters a minute. And maybe it sounds like a very slow transmission these days, but I think uh, uh, it was impressive back then. Another uh, communication uh, method that was used relying on the light was uh, the one in the Great uh, Wall of China, uh, just uh, sending binary messaging. We have a problem, we don't have a problem. Uh, and uh, impressive uh, um, transmission for, for that kind of messaging is that uh, there are messages uh, sent out uh, to seven kilometers distance in less than one hour. Uh, then moving on in the history, uh, we know that uh, Daniel Colladon demonstrates the total internal reflection for the first time in 1841, which was an experiment repeated by John Tyndall in 1884. In many uh, historical books, uh, John Tyndall, Tyndall was called the father of this effect, uh, but uh, there are proofs that uh, Colladon was the first one who uh, discovered this effect. And how was the discovery made? Well, using the light through a light stream that was falling down and the light was staying trapped in the light stream. And we'll go through the physics of this uh, effect later on. And here we can see there is a lot of acceleration in this field from 1950s to uh, the last years of this century from the first uh, moment where the fiber optics uh, was coined as a term from Mariande Campani, um, which was the team who developed the core and the cladding of the fiber. Um, then uh, low loss systems were uh, introduced from 1000 dB per kilometer to 20 dB, which made sense to use them for transferring information. Uh, then some other inventions, semiconductor, then the first li uh, life fiber optic uh, link in the US and in the Europe in the same year. Uh, in 1977, then uh, amplifiers were introduced. And uh, since I mentioned the uh, window three before, that was uh, period in 1990s where the use of that was introduced. Uh, and then it goes to increasing the speed and the total amount of transfer. transfer. Uh, now let's look at the physics behind this. How does the total infraction work? What is the total reflection? Uh, we saw previously that uh, Colladon uh, 
discovered this as a light trapped in a, a water stream. Uh, and why does this happen? Each material has a refractive index called N, and that index refracts, uh, describes how fast light propagates in that medium. Higher the density of the material, lower the speed of the light in it. So let's get the light into the vacuum. Uh, now, this is not an interactive session, but I would ask this question. Do you remember this from the um, high school or university days? It's 300,000 kilometers uh, per second. And that's the speed of light in vacuum. Now, uh, the speed of light in water or other more dense materials, or the materials used for the fiber, we'll see later on, is different, it's lower, and it depends on the uh, this uh, index of refraction. Um, if it's 1.5, then this speed is two thirds of the speed uh, of light in vacuum. So when the light travels from one to another medium with different index n, then there is a refraction of the light or the path of the light changes. As we can see on the picture below, uh, if we go to uh, travel uh, using this small angle uh, compared to the perpendicular axis, then that goes away from that axis. And this is a phenomenon explained by the Snell's law. When we have this angle wide enough, reaching the so-called critical angle, then we see that this effect where the light doesn't travel to the second medium anymore. And then any other angle that is higher than this one uh, helps to see the phenomena of total internal reflection. So all the lights that is trapped in the water in this case, or in the core of the fiber we'll see later on. And just to put a bit more context on this one, you've probably seen many fountains like this one. This one is particular from the night light show in Barcelona. Um, then another uh, proof of this effect is when swimming and we are deep enough, we can we are diving, we can see a shadow or a reflection of uh, ourselves in the surface of the water, then also the laser trapped within the uh, handle of the glass. So this is how we can explain the total reflection, which is very important for the guided uh, wave, uh, light wave in the fiber. I see there on the left-hand side uh, moved a bit, uh, but uh, that doesn't change uh, what I'm trying to explain here which is the physics of the fiber, which has the core, the cladding, and, and, the, and the buffer. Uh, the key components of the fiber for the transmission are the core and the cladding, because most of the light stays in the core, and uh, just a little bit uh, the, the travels uh, in the cladding, which is uh, the inner layer of the cladding. Uh, and uh, this is, if you can see here, this is how it, the visible light, uh, travels using total internal reflection. Uh, depending on the engineering of the uh, core and the cladding of the fiber, we can have a single mode or multi-mode fibers, and they are mostly made of glass, uh, which is silica, uh, with some other uh, dopants to change the index of refraction, or for multi-mode fibers, we can use a uh, plastic also, there are applications of, if you've seen probably uh, some audio cables using uh, uh, optical um, core made of plastic. Uh, this is how the core profile looks like of a multi-mode and a single mode fibers. With multi-mode fibers, we have a step index uh, fiber, graded index fiber which is uh, changing from the center of the core towards the cladding and uh, matching the one in the cladding. And you see there is a continuous change, whereas at the step index change, uh, it's a sharp change from one to another index. And, uh, uh, and this is 
a case where we can see multiple modes of the light traveling in the core. Um, and this is because uh, the core is wider and uh, there are multiple light paths. So the modes are light paths, whereas the single mode fiber has a thinner core, uh, smaller in size, and uh, it has only one light path. Uh, just to put some numbers, so the core of the single mode fiber used for the DWM applications, uh, it's uh, between eight and nine micrometers, depending on the fiber type. Then the cladding, uh, uh, it's standard, it has a standard size of 125 micrometers. And then these are some industry standards of uh, buffer and jacket, which are used for protecting the core and the cladding. Uh, we need to remember that the core and the cladding are the only materials responsible for uh, guiding the wave. Now, let's move to the fiber properties. Uh, attenuation is the main one and that comes first to attention. And that is the weakening of the light throughout the transmission. So the signal loses energy from the source to the destination. And um, the reasons for that are leaky modes, uh, photon absorption, scattering, and um, some other effects that are also specific to uh, the frequencies used. For example, we have these uh, OH ions that are absorbing more in the frequency range of about uh, 13, uh, 50 uh, nanometers. And uh, if you can see here the profile of the attenuation, it's obvious that the C and L band that I previously mentioned are the most uh, convenient for transmitting the light because we have the least uh, absorption and the least uh, attenuation there. Other effects that are uh, very um, particular for the optical fibers, uh, the next one is the dispersion which can be model dispersion in the multi-mode fibers, but uh, when specifically speaking to the single mode fibers, then we have a chromatic dispersion, which can be, which can be material dispersion and wave-based dispersion. Material dispersion is the effect of the index of refraction, depending on the frequency that is being uh, transmitted. So at uh, different frequencies travel with different speeds, and in the example here, we see that uh, when there is also a uh, refraction added to uh, the transmission, we see a spread of different uh, wavelengths. So this is the white composite signal, the sunlight, and then this is the rainbow. And uh, the wave dispersion, it's due to the geometry of the fiber and how the wave uh, travels. I mentioned before, a little bit of the light travels in the clouding, and uh, if that changes over time, uh, then uh, the frequencies traveling there will be faster. So there will be a chromatic dispersion caused by that. Then on top of this, there is a polarization mode dispersion. This happens due to the components of the wavelength that are traveling orthogonally and different component travel with different speed over time, creating a spread of the pulse. In order to compensate for this, there were dispersion compensation fiber developed with negative uh, chromatic dispersion. But nowadays, there are even better compensation techniques because all the residual um, chromatic dispersion is compensated at the receiver end. And this is how graphically looks like uh, when we have a, a dispersion that is broadening the uh, pulses. So at the source, this is how they look like. And these are the uh, end after a, a long enough transmission and uh, dispersion that can uh, lead to an inter-symbol interference and uh, misleading uh, zeros to ones and uh, vice versa. As I said, this can be fully compensated nowadays at the receiver end. Uh, and we don't need to, to use the DCF fibers. 
Another very uh, interesting effect is the Raman scattering, which is the scattering of the light inter interacting with the matter. With the matter, this is due to the fiber atoms uh, uh, in this case. Um, so we have uh, linear effects, which were the attenuation and the dispersion, and non-linear effects, which is the Raman scattering that there is a forward mixing here and so on, but as the most significant uh, for cover Raman uh, scattering here, and it's a non-elastic uh, effect. Um, it depends uh, on, the, on the intensity of the light and uh, some other factors. But what actually happens here is that uh, the higher frequencies during the transmission transfer energy to the lower frequencies. And when we transmit a signal with set of frequencies, at the end of the transmission, we see a tilted spectrum as it is here. And this is not a, a linear to all the frequency. Rather, we have this kind of uh, graph that explains the uh, efficiency of the transfer. But we, we can see later on that uh, this actually can be used for amplification. And uh, if it's used uh, deliberately, it's called the stimulated thermal scattering. I mentioned multiple effects, uh, multiple properties of the fibers before, and uh, they are all one way on a, or another um, changed or engineered depending on the fiber type. So the one of the first and uh, the oldest to today that stayed in the industry are uh, G652, uh, International Telecommunication Union Standard uh, um, Code for the standard single mode fiber. And it has a dispersion shifted uh, zone so the dispersion here is natural as it occurs at uh, 13, 10 nanometers. And they are also called a non-dispersion sheet at the uh, fibers. Uh, later on, we realized if you want to use them at different uh, wavelengths, uh, we need to change the dispersion. And there were the 653 fibers introduced. But then when the TWDN systems were introduced, we realized that uh, maybe they are not the best ones. And then there were some other industry standards added later on for uh, submarine um, applications. Uh, then um, non-zero dispersion shifted fiber, which are also widely used in DWM networks, as well as the oldest ones here. And uh, one of the newer standards is uh, bending insensitive fiber. Uh, G657. In 2009, when they were in the early stage of uh, adoption, I had this uh, project that I was working on to create an office of box and to simulate a fiber to the home in the guiding. And um, I made um, several scenarios to compare the loss. And if you can see here, um, when the bending radius of the circle I was following was uh, 35 millimeters for the first type of G657. There was no additional loss. Whereas when I used the old uh, standard single mode fiber, there was 0.8. And then moving down, you can see uh, which each smaller bending radius, the difference is even higher. Just to note here that uh, 3 dB loss is a 50% loss of the energy. So when we do a three bands at 20 millimeter band radius, we lost most, almost half of the energy when using G652, and it's only 0.12 dB with uh, the bending sensitive fiber. So that was the medium that we use for uh, the optical highways and the DWDM systems. Uh, now, looking more into the amplifiers. So I mentioned we are in this uh, medium where there is a ultra high, ultra low loss uh, over the years uh, about uh, now the best fibers can go as low as 154, 0.154 dB per kilometer. 
why do we need amplifiers? Well, look at this uh, specific example. We have this case of a cable between Japan and uh, west coast of the US. It's about 8,000 kilometers. So let's put some numbers to it. If we want to transmit a signal to the other end, we need to consider the loss of 1,232 dB, which is huge. And then if we want to uh, transmit a signal of a QPSK modulation, that we will need a OSMR difference of a, a 12 dB. So in that case, uh, we would uh, need to receive a signal of minus 42 dBm in the end. And in order to achieve that, without amplification, we will need to transmit uh, 1,190 dBm. Uh, that translates to 10 to 116 watts. And just to put it into context, uh, uh, the power emitted by our sun is uh, at the factor of 10, 45, 10 to 24. And we will need to have this number of suns. So <laughs> it's uh, it's impossible. Even if we have that, we will burn the, the fiber and everything by our time. So we need the amplifiers. And there are three main categories, the IBM dot fiber amplifiers, uh, the Raman amplifiers, and the semiconductor optical amplifiers. The first ones are using the Albion ions to amplify the optical signal. The second ones are using the Raman nonlinearity that I mentioned later on to transfer energy from higher frequencies to signal of interest. And then uh, the last ones are using the sonic conductor material with electrical pumping to amplify the optical signal. Let's look at the first type, Airbnb dot uh, fiber amplifier. They can be used at the beginning or at the end of the channel. Uh, what happens here is when you transmit a light at certain wavelength, in this case, 980 nanometers, some of the photons are absorbed by the Albion ions. And what happens is that they are excited you can think of like uh, eating a chocolate or sugar and we get a sugar rush and we get excited. And after a while, some of the energy is being uh, transmitted. So this is what happens in this case. And uh, some of the photons are being transmitted, but because that's uh, less energy, it's, it gets transmitted in a shifted wavelength. And in this case, if you use this specific wavelength, we end up having photons emitted at 15, 25 nanometer uh, window, which is the one that we need for the C-band transmission. We also need to remember that some of this is noise, which is un unwanted emission. Uh, what happens when we transmit signal in that uh, range, we get uh, amplification. So one photon of that wavelength uh, gets another one paired here and the, and the signal is amplified. This is, how, this, is, this is how it looks like in the real world. This is the card that has uh, the pump and the same wavelength that I mentioned, the, the RPM dot fiber, and then uh, uh, the amplification happens that there are two input and output detector to control uh, the intensity, which is needed. And these are the most common uh, amplifiers in the BWDM networks, both in terrestrial and subsea. Another very common and uh, uh, very uh, specific type of amplification is the Raman amplification. As I mentioned before, this is the effect where the higher frequencies are transmitting light to the lower frequencies. And the way we are using this is we are pumping light in most of the cases, against the signal flow, but it, it could be uh, with the signal flow, and they are amplifying exactly the range we, we, we need. So you can see the difference here without Raman and with Raman and how the game happens. The Raman is using the fiber as medium to uh, excite, 
to, to pump a light at higher frequency and get it uh, transmitted in similar way, like with the alpha, with exciting atoms to a virtual state and then releasing the phonons to a vibration states that are at the wavelength that we need. Uh, compared to the alpha, this one has a uh, much lower noise and therefore is used for a longer spans of uh, transmission to uh, improve the noise, uh, the signal to noise uh, ratio. But uh, we'll see in the last section that there are many challenges with deploying the, the Raman amplifiers and not always the predicted uh, or calculated gain can be achieved. In most of the cases where we have a long enough links, we use a hybrid uh, scenario where we have a useful uh, signal, the signal that we need amplified both by ADFA and Raman, and it could be even ADFA at the uh, source, which is called the booster. And the last uh, amplifier type of this section are the semiconductor amplifiers, optical amplifiers. In this case, the active media is electrically pumped to amplify photons traveling across it. And uh, it's a semiconductor material, which is properly dot. Uh, uh, due to their fast resp response, uh, these uh, semiconductor amplifiers uh, introduce signal distortions. And um, uh, for that, they are not perfect, but what they are really good for is that they have a really wide uh, range of amplification, much wider than the previous two amplifier types. So a little bit of summary and comparison between these three types. We have the ADFA has the largest uh, amplification range, uh, but uh, on the other side, it's not really good uh, uh, with the bandwidth that can cover, uh, whereas the semiconductor amplifiers, they are the best in that category. And the Raman game to use uh, uh, really good uh, uh, signal to noise ratio improvement. But uh, one thing to be mentioned with the semiconductor amplifiers is that they are not mature for, for uh, industrial applications yet. And uh, moving to the last category, um, so Raman amplifiers, which are very sensitive to the effects of the fiber imperfections, can, can experience uh, many drawbacks. Uh, well, most significantly, it's not, gain, not uh, achieving the gain that is needed and calculated, but also they can go as far as burning the port because there was a lot of light reflected back from the pump and uh, it uh, got amplified with the signal. Um, the most of the impact comes from the initial connector that is connected to them. So uh, the modern high performance systems are much more sensitive to connector losses. Dirty connectors can be the most uh, common uh, causes for these uh, Raman amp issues. Um, if it's contaminated and it's not in the core, it's still dangerous because contamination can move to the core and cause the issue. Um, this can, the connector can increase uh, the loss, but also the back reflection, which both are um, causing problem, but the back reflection can cause even higher problem, as I said, burning the port. And um, zone is uh, acceptance criteria to have this uh, connector accepted are defined by this standard here, IEC. IEC. Uh, this is how the zones of acceptance look like. And ideally we would like to have a clean connector without any scratches, dirts, or um, factory uh, imperfections. And um, some of them can be accepted if, they are, if there is a scratch in the outer cladding, for example, but some of them must be uh, moved. Uh, and this is a 
one example where we have a burnt common connector. Um, some more cases where we experience a loss or a high back reflection uh, that can lead to Raman gain issues. It's very important to mention that the, most of the amplification happens in the first five kilometers from the Raman point and the rest of it in the 20 kilometers. So these events of the uh, loss and reflection need to be carefully examined in this section. As an in industry standard, we want to have a, a loss of the connector lower than uh, 0 0.5 dB and um, fusion supplies lower than 0.2 or even sometimes 0.12 dB. Um, for this, we use the OTDR to um, test this section and uh, we use one kilometer launch and uh, short pulses of 10 to 13 nanoseconds resolution of 55 to 20 kilometers range. Um, and when it comes to the back reflection as a rule of thumb, a uh, rule of thumb needs to be um, lower than five, 20, minus 25 dB, preferably lower than minus 30. And these are some uh, research studies that uh, I've been looking at and uh, we've been testing and uh, you can see uh, if a Raman amplifier has a target gain of uh, 15 dB uh, at 15, 15 nanometers, one dB connector loss at zero kilometers can cause a four dB gain reduction. Whereas if the same one is at 10 kilometers, it's two dB uh, uh, gain reduction. And there is much more to be uh, researched here, but it's definitely one of the sections where we need to uh, keep a close close eye and uh, have a perfect uh, fiber connected to it. That was uh, what I had prepared. I hope it was interesting and not too much into unnecessary technical details. And I skip intentionally some of them. So I'm open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Blagoj. So uh, if any of you have any questions, please type them out in the chat. So we have one question here. Yeah. Uh, what are the core sizes of the multi-mode uh, fibers compared to the single-mode fibers? Oh, yes, uh, that's a good thank you for the question. Uh, let's go to the picture. I think I have it in some of the slides later on. Was it? Yeah, here. Yeah, so I didn't mention the specifics. Um, uh, for the multi-mode fibers, um, we have the core uh, designed at uh, 50 micrometers for OM2 and OM, OM3 and OM4 and 2, 3, and 4. And OM1, which is the oldest standard, has a 62.5 micrometers. So they are wide enough to allow wider angle of uh, inserting the light, which creates a multi modes of light path. So 50 and 62.5, whereas the cladding size is the same as the single, as in the single mode fibers. Thank you, Blagoj. We have uh, one more question coming up. Um, just a second. So the other question is, when do we use Raman amplifiers in practice and how long the link should be? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Raman amplifiers. Um, so normally because of the FX we uh, mentioned and the risks of uh, implementing them, we need to have a uh, long links, uh, links to have a business case to put them in. And um, I'm looking for the slide. Yeah, maybe here, this one. Uh, as an industry standard, we should always look at links longer than uh, 80, 80 kilometers, but uh, what it really matters here is the attenuation of the link. And uh, normally it needs to be uh, higher than 15 dB loss. So 80 kilometers and 15 dB loss, but uh, depending on the vendor of the equipment, it can be a longer link, even longer link without that amplification. But that's the, like the menu. We wouldn't uh, put a Raman in a link shorter than that. 
Thank you, Blago, for your answers. So we have uh, one more question here. Uh, how do we configure optical power in amplifier for a long distance link? Like what number of amplifiers? And before you uh, answer that, we also have a praise. Uh, no particular question. It was a great presentation and thank you very much. Thank so you. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, well, uh, for configuring the amplifier, we need to take into account, maybe this is like a, uh, interesting, but not too practical scenario. Uh, we need to make sure that um, we reach the sensitivity of the receiver end. So in this case, uh, it was calculated uh, using the uh, noise figure of 4 dB as a uh, minus 42 dBn. And we'll need to make sure that uh, the signal and uh, at the source is uh, launched uh, at the uh, right level to avoid the nonlinear effects and at the same time amplify, which when is the low signal, uh, when is the low um, loss uh, span, we normally use ADFA maybe at the end, at the receiver end only. When it's uh, slightly higher than that one, we add a booster at the beginning. And then when it's a uh, much higher loss, then we add the Raman amplifier. But this is oversimplified. Uh, it's a lot of uh, calculations behind this, and it also depends on uh, how many um, spans are between two points without uh, uh, regenerating the, the link. Yeah, I, I hope it answered uh, the questions, but I'm open for more to my email uh, account if someone is more interested in, and we can go to details as much as I can share. Uh, thank you, Blago. One more question, and I believe this is the last one for today, is that uh, can we use only Raman amplifiers? Yes, there are cases, but it doesn't um, make a business case, and also it doesn't make a, um, sense in most of the situations because it's uh, uh, more expensive and it's... Um, it uh, takes more attention to achieve the, the gain where it's needed. So going back to the table, uh, with Raman, we only have a limitation to how much gain we can have. So with ADFA, we have a wider range and we can operate in different uh, circumstances. So technically, yes, but practically, it's not uh, um, really a good uh, case to use it. Thank you. I hope that clarifies all of the questions and help everyone understand better. Um, if there are any, if there are not any more questions, I believe that we can wrap this session up today. Thank you, Blagoj, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for, for attending. I hope that we can have another similar session uh, with, with you again in the, in the future. And I hope that you are, are happy with uh, the turnout today and with the presentation, of course. <laughs> thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Have a nice day, everyone. See you in the next three imagine session. Thank you.